welcome to the monthly BV Magazine podcast, your genuine slice of rural Dorset life. This is episode two for November 2022. Hello from me, Terry Bennett. And hello from me, Jenny Devitt. In this episode... The repair shop Sonaz takes on the random 19. Fishy tales from a shipping container in Wimborne. The local businessman who's trying to make game a more mainstream part of our diet. And owner of Athelhampton House Giles Keating gives us his Dorset Island Discs choices. But to start, your letters. The first one is from Alan Morton of Shaftesbury. This weekend I passed a group of what I took to be a group of ramblers. Twelve or so people of retirement age, all in stout boots, wearing sensible waterproofs and carrying backpacks. However, I was driving and I slowly passed them on a narrow single track lane. The issue was that most scattered before me to both sides of the lane. Surely it's a hiker's basic 101 knowledge that on a road you walk in single file and keep to the right. By scattering on both sides, they made it far harder for me to pass them all safely. Some had unnecessarily launched into the hedge. Others stood to the side of the road. Others, busy chatting, sort of edged over but stayed side by side. Please, walkers, by all means fill a quiet lane when there is no traffic, but do us careful drivers the courtesy of moving to just one side in single file when you allow us to pass. Tony Barrett near Verwood writes... Great to have Simon Hall back in your politics page again. I, like Dr Matthews in your September issue, had noticed his absence. His column, that was on page 22 of the BV in October, was apposite as the Westminster Circus continues to play out this month. As I write, Liz Truss is still PM, but will she be tomorrow? By the time this is printed, I suspect she will not be. I did feel that perhaps Ken Huggins' column from the Greens this month was unusually underwhelming. He's usually one of my favourite viewpoints to read, and I wonder if perhaps his actual views on the current Tory mess may have been a little too strong for the BV's pages. I have been horrified to learn of the case of farm cruelty in West Dorset recently. The cruelty and suffering appear to have been bad enough when it came to light in the court case. But what is worse is that this was a red tractor certified farm, which had been visited repeatedly by trading standards due to concerns over the animal welfare for six years. Quite why it took so long for the situation to be resolved and the animals properly cared for is beyond me. How can a farm with such ongoing and long-standing animal welfare issues still retain its red tractor status? And more importantly, how are we supposed to now trust this alleged beacon of shopper security? Once earned, do Red Tractor not return and check up on its certified badge wearers? Once again, we are fooled by the marketing. How lucky we are in Dorset to have such a wealth of local options to buy direct from producers and not have to trust the blurb we read is actually true. And that's from Alan Pinman of Dorchester. A. Harding from Shaftesbury writes... Are warm hubs being set up in Dorset for the vulnerable this winter? I can thus far find no mention of an organised, unified project to do so, though I'm aware of certain individual businesses and community organisations who are offering a warm space to those who find themselves alone and cold and probably hungry through the coldest months. Obviously, a collective effort is most effective, but if there are numerous disparate groups setting up individual hubs, then a central resource to know where, when and what's available would be incredibly useful to share among those who may well need it. I fear the coming winter will prove difficult and long for many, many of us. Anne Ryman of the Chalk Valley writes, Thank you for your feature on Mike Howe, the Thatcher. I always enjoy the craftsmen and women featured in Tracy Beardsley's excellent articles, but this one particularly struck a chord as my grandfather was a Thatcher. I remember being in his dusty shed, playing with the very ladders and tools you showed. It's also very encouraging to see such an emphasis on apprenticeships and true training. The old skills aren't just a nice piece of history. They're essential for so many things, and I fear that every year we lose so much knowledge before it's been passed on to future generations, as the young people are driven to university, bypassing fulfilling crafts and trades. Features the repair shop's expert upholsterer, Sonaz, takes on the random 19. 
Sonaz Nuranvari is a British Iranian upholsterer who lives near Wimborne, best known as the resident upholstery expert on the BBC's repair shop. At the age of 17, Sonaz became the first female apprentice at Sunseeker Yachts, where she developed her eye for detail and exacting craftsmanship standards. At 25, she started her own business, which has since grown into a bespoke interior studio and workshop, which includes interior design and restoration. Her new brand, House of Sonaz, has just launched. She hopes to rewrite what it means to be a manufacturer and purveyor of home products creating furniture that will last a lifetime and bring joy, using processes that will not harm the environment. Sonaz is passionate about manufacturing in the UK, and from her own experience, she believes deeply in apprenticeships. And so do the questions. Number one, what's your relationship with Dorset? I came to Dorset because I applied for an apprenticeship at Sunseeker Yachts, and they wouldn't accept me unless I lived in the area. I lived in Hampshire at the time and I didn't drive, so I moved to Dorset for that and have been here ever since. I've had the opportunity to move away, but I do love Dorset. What was the last song you sang out loud in your car? I Am Woman. Who's the artist? No idea. But it was I Am Woman. What a great song. Very empowering. And that was I Am Woman by Emmy Melly, not the 1972 Helen Reddy one. The film you last watched? It was The Luckiest Girl Alive. I saw it on Netflix and I totally recommend it. It was pretty profound. There were lots of twists and turns and I thought the ending was genius. It's Friday night. You have the house to yourself and no work is allowed. What are you going to do? Pretty much every Friday, my set routine is to put on a face mask and redo the nail polish on my toes. But if I was going all out, I would run a bath light some candles, add some music, a glass of wine, red probably, and a book. Maybe not in the bath with the book. That's for in bed later, a party for one. What's your comfort meal? When we were kids, we used to have, it's it's really terrible actually, we used to have porridge with sugar and butter in it. Terrible. But if I'm feeling like I need a bit of comfort, that's my go-to. But my other comfort food is a Persian meal called gourmet sabzi. I absolutely love it. It's loads of herbs made into a stewy sauce and you have it with rice. It's a really unusual taste and it's one of my favourite meals. What would you like to tell the 15-year-old you? What would I tell me? I'm 15, so I'm still at school. I may have been head girl by then. My life was looking up. I think I'd tell myself that everything is going to be all right. The best flavour of crisps? Obviously, is prawn cocktail. And the best biscuit for dunking? Again, obviously, custard creams. What book did you read recently that stayed with you? A Thousand Splendid Sons by Khaled Hosseini. I've had the book for a long time, but I finally read it, and it was heartbreaking. I cried. It's a profoundly affecting story about people in Kabul following their lives through the war in Afghanistan. It was a a difficult, emotional read. What's your secret superpower? Maybe, despite the fact I have so much going on, I tend always to look at um, everything's fine. And your most annoying trait? Well, that depends who you ask. I'm sure most people would say I'm too loud. I'm quite direct. That can be annoying. I'm a perfectionist. That's very annoying. Hmm, there's quite a few, to be honest. What shop can you not pass without going in? Oh, I love, I love a good deli. It's the homemade hummus, the pesto, the interesting crisps, and all the other things you can dip into said hummus. Then there's the beautiful big fat olives, the sausage rolls, including vegan ones, which are usually really good too. Like I said, I love a deli. Your favourite quote? I often tell myself, if it was that easy, everyone would be doing it. I use it to push myself on. Things are hard. Things are not always easy. And I just like to remind myself of that. Tell us about one of the best evenings you've ever had. I should probably say my wedding evening, shouldn't I? But my girlfriends and I have a thing called Tuesday night dinners. We all used to go sea swimming on a Tuesday and then take it in turns to go into each other's houses. It turned into Tuesday night dinners, even when we didn't sea swim and it wasn't a Tuesday. It was a good time in our lives. We were just all girls together. 
we would share, support. We're all from really different walks of life. And it was just a really great time. We still do it now, just not every Tuesday or even on a Tuesday. I've had some amazing evenings with those ladies. Too many to pick one. What was the last gift you either gave or received? It was for my bookkeeper, Louise. I bought her some Dorset handmade soap and one of those things where there's a nice smelly liquid in a bottle and there's sticks coming out of it. What are they called? It was from Dorset too, also handmade. Can't remember what they're called. And the editor said, it's a reed diffuser. You're welcome. I can't think of anything I've received recently. I need to do something about that. <laughs> Your top three most visited websites. Oh, I love a bit of Pinterest. Very good for inspiration. And I love a bit of Airbnb as well for trip inspiration. The other thing I do is look at positive news a lot. What in life is frankly a mystery to you? The fact that when you do clothes washing, you lose socks in the deep, dark depths of the machine and end up with odd ones. It's bizarre. And when you have a new tube of toothpaste, it lasts a while. But then when you get to the end, that last bit seems to last as long as the rest of the tube did. I don't know how that works. Also, light. Travelling from the cosmos. In Swanage, they do stargazing events at Dalston Astronomy Centre. And you can go and look at a galaxy that's like 7 billion light years away. It looks like grains of sugar. And the light you're seeing is 7 billion years old. That's a total mystery to me. Mind-bending thoughts. Chip shop chips or home-baked cake? Well, both, I'd say. Why not have it all? You have the power to pass one law tomorrow, uncontested. What would you do? I think that it should be law that everyone must have an apprentice. My apprenticeship really changed my life. But also, maybe that getting renewable energy fitted to your house should be free. Can we squeeze them both into one law? Filleting since he was 14. Meet the fourth generation fishmonger, with no better fish to fry when it comes to his life choices. By Tracy Beardsley. Ask the way to Bell's Fisheries in Wimborne and you'll probably get a blank look. Ask for John the Fish and people know exactly who you're looking for. In his bright blue salopettes teamed with a funky floral shirt and loud tie on the day we met, this great character of a man has made selling fish into an art form. So much so, his nickname embodies his craft. If you should be asking for John the Fish, you'll actually find yourself directed to a car park. A huge lorry container, surrounded by a white picket fence, has been converted into John Bell's unique fishmonger's stall. The fish is displayed with flair. You'll find scallops, hake, haddock and cod amongst a cheery coral reef scene among the delicious smells of smoked fish. And expect a performance. As your fish is expertly filleted, John the fish will tell you its provenance, share easy-to-follow recipes and advise on accompanying wine. And once he knows your name, he never forgets it. The sign proclaims Bell's Fresh Fish, established 1892. John is a fourth-generation fishmonger in a family that's always been full of entrepreneurial spirit. In 1892, John's great-grandmother, Eliza, imported from France some of the first oil-fired ranges, and so began the Bell's fish business. In rapid time, the family owned five shops in York. John's grandfather, Alfred, became a partner in the business at the age of 18. John explains the shops were known as wet, dried and fried. There'd be wet fish sales in the morning, fish and chips sold at lunchtime, and then smoked fish in the afternoon. In the evenings, it was time to fry again. Phenomenally hard work. The two world wars changed everything. In the first, Alfred fought in Flanders and returned badly wounded. He traded through the 1920s, but an accountant, crooked as a barrel of fish hooks, fiddled the whole family out of its business. Never work shy, Alfred moved to London and toiled on the roads until a settlement from the financial fiasco saw him returning to fishmongering establishing a new business in Fulham with the princely sum of £3,000. It was here that John's father, Ernest, born in 1922, began learning the family trade. The Second World War saw Ernest conscripted and Alfred's shops bombed. Surviving the war, Ernest worked for the biggest chain of fishmongers at the time, McFisheries. After 20 years, he fulfilled his dream and opened a shop in the place where he had holidayed on the south coast. 
An only child, John worked for his father after school and on Saturdays. He taught me old world skills from centuries ago. He passed them on to me and I've passed them on to my son, Joe, whose latest business venture is building a smoker. At 16, John the Fish began his formal apprenticeship, getting the best training in stock control, how to treat customers and knife skills. Quality first, then speed comes naturally, says John. My dad made retailing fish fun. He taught me to know the product, to like it and to know how to prepare it and cook it. John's natty attire is also down to his dad's timely advice. Fishmongering is a messy trade from the waist down. Dad believed it was important to look presentable from the top up. He was a stickler for smart hair and a clean-shaven appearance. John the Fish has been trading in Wimborne for nearly 30 years, and he still sees customers he started serving as an apprentice. One lady used to come to me when I was 15, and she still buys fish from me to this day. Cues for his fresh fish are common, as they are for the Saturday pop-up cafes run by his wife, Sally. People sit on the converted whiskey barrels behind the picket fence and enjoy the dish of the day with a glass of wine or beer. There's no menu and no booking. It's first come, fish served. The lights in the lorry container flicker into life at 4am, five days a week, as John, along with his team Mike and Sarah, start curing, hot smoking and cold smoking fish in preparation for the day. There's always time for a worker's breakfast of fish too. I eat fish every day, says John. Sustainability and seasonality is key to this trade. I don't buy frozen fish, processed fish or imported fish. I want to fillet it myself. I use pool fishermen for our shellfish and have agents in Cornish and Devonports, such as Newlin and Brixham for prime fish. Why do I need red snapper from a different hemisphere when we've still got the best fishing grounds in the world? I'm driven by the love of what I sell and my love of people. Talk about full circle... My father worked for me for 10 years before he died. In fact, he was working right up until the day before he died. Now that's a lifelong passion for what you do. Dorset Island Discs. Giles Keating, the owner of Athelhampton House, one of England's finest Tudor manors, has overseen a major plan of maintenance on the much-loved building. Following a spell as a research fellow at the London Business School, Giles Keating was chief economist at a major international bank for 30 years. The political events of this last month would have been my meat and drink. It would certainly have been a pretty busy few weeks. He spent his time at the bank studying the economy and finance not just of the UK, but of the major and emerging economies across the globe. He first visited China before the Tiananmen Square massacre and went back frequently, watching it grow from a primitive economy to a global power. He toured the world, visiting Asia, the Americas and the Middle East. I spent my time examining, talking to people, telling them what I thought I knew and discovering what they actually knew. When he retired from banking, he cast around for new ventures. When you retire, you can't just lie down. Giles became increasingly interested in the modern finance revolution, bringing tech into the finance arena, first via a robo-advisor startup, a type of automated financial advisor that provides algorithm-driven wealth management services with little to no human intervention, and then in digital currency. But with more time on his hands, Giles needed a new project. I've always had a yen to get closer to the spirit and architecture of the Tudor era. I also have four children and have just welcomed my first grandchild. And I wanted a house which could accommodate big family get-togethers. On top of which, I wanted a new business, not just one to sit on, but one I could be involved in, making it live and work. Old houses need looking after. They need to be alive. But it's a niche property search. Tudor houses are in rather limited supply. The selection of those that may also be run as businesses is even tinier. And there seems to be no checkbox on Zoopla for Minstrel's Gallery, which is a glaring omission. It took many years, but I finally found Athelhampton, and from the very first visit I knew it was the right one. The house was in perfectly livable condition when I moved in, but as the bigger projects got underway it became less so. Guests weren't keen when flushing the toilet meant filling a bucket of water from the river. After two years, the heavy-duty works are complete. Most were simply maintenance, sorting the roof, etc. But there was also work on revealing the original Tudor kitchen, of course, as featured in the BV July 22. 
So now it's about using the house and encouraging people to use it too. We've opened more of the rooms to the public, created interpretive panels to show the timeline of the ownership, and we really want to use the space. We've had a fabulous half term with the Tudors in residence, reenacting the house as it would have been originally. This summer, we hosted the stars of the Royal Ballet with musicians from the Royal Opera House for a fabulous weekend of dance. Sadly, diary clashes mean they can't return next year, but are already booked for 2024. And of course, we have the Dorset Food and Drink Christmas Fair coming in December. Upwards of 2,000 people come through the doors. We're also utilising the Long Gallery for local artists. We currently have an Elizabeth Sporn Modern Icons exhibition until the end of November. Giles has written a book based on characters from Athel Hampton's past. As he researched for a new guidebook as a lockdown hobby, the extraordinary history of the house and its occupants seemed ready-made for a story. He based it around Anne of Athel Hampton, featuring historical characters and events. A second book is due out in the spring. And so to Giles's eight music choices, in no particular order, along with how and why they stuck in his life. First, Come Ye Sons of Art, the ode for Queen Mary's birthday by Henry Purcell. I just adore Purcell's music and especially this ode, which is such a happy celebration and raises the heart every time. Sound the trumpets. And as an added bonus, it has a link to Athelhampton, since Queen Mary's aunt, Lady Frances Keatley, lived at Athelhampton around the time this was composed. August by Taylor Swift. A change of gear after Purcell. The date gives a clue to why this is here. This track is from Folklore, one of two albums that Swift released in an incredible burst of creativity during lockdown. I played this a lot when driving down the almost empty roads to Athelhampton, where I was helping supervise a major construction project, which made the house well nigh uninhabitable, hence the driving. The album is simply one amazing hit after another, and I think August especially hits the spot in bringing out the sheer emotional intensity of a summer love affair. Pink Floyd's Atom Heart Mother Sweet. This had been out for a while when I went to uni, but it was a favourite of those years, and listening again recently, I think it has stood the test of time. It's incredibly original, spanning rock and classical, a kind of rock sonata that uses any and every available musical medium, including choirs and motorbikes. Yasha Heifetz are playing Bach's Sonata No. 1 in G minor. This is a 1953 recording. These unaccompanied solo violin works by Bach are quite stunning and, of course, require a superb musician to play them. Green sleeves. I've always loved folk music, perhaps because it somehow spans the Celtic side of my ancestry and the English side, or perhaps just because it's wonderful to listen to. Green sleeves was first published in 1580 at the heart of Athelhampton's Tudor era, though some people say it was composed some decades earlier by Henry VIII. Like most people, I really only know the first few verses and the chorus but there are a total of 17 verses, and I'd like to take a vocal version of that to the island so I can take some time to get to know them all. Rose Tint My World. This is from the Rocky Horror Show 1973 original London cast. A key soundtrack to my school years. There was even a production based on it in the school hall. Don't ask me how they got away with that. It's a brilliant and fun show with fantastic dancing music, but it's deadly serious below the surface. Not just in bringing gender issues to the fore decades before current debates, but also in its mantra for all aspects of life. Don't dream it, be it. The Doctor Who theme music by Ron Grainer, the original 1960s version realised by Delia Derbyshire. There was a handful of iconic TV shows when I was a kid, and I was only allowed to watch a few hours of TV a week. And while picking my Dorset Island discs, I found myself wrenched between the Avengers, the Diana Rigg version of course, Thunderbirds and The Prisoner. In the end, Doctor Who won out, because I think its amazing original electronic sounds will be playing over and over again on the island. And of course, the Seeds of Doom series was filmed at Athelhampton. Spoiler alert, at the end, the RAF has to bomb the house to destruction because the giant rogue plant has taken it over. Perhaps that's the real truth behind the destruction of Tynan Manor. I think we should be told. Lady Gaga's Alejandro. There were so many contenders for my final choice, ranging from Verdi's La Donna e Mobile through to Barry's Lazarus. 
Gargo won out for the sheer energy and craziness, including those amazing costumes, and especially headgear, from the video that the music evokes. I'll need that kind of energy to keep me going on the island. My book choice would be A Pattern Language, Towns Building Construction, by C. Alexander, S. Ishikawa, M. Silverstein and Associates. That's 1977. This is simply one of the great books. Ostensibly about architecture and town planning, it's really about life in every sense, how people live and interact with one another, grow up and grow old. Also, though published before the internet, it has hyperlinks throughout, encouraging one to leap from one section to another, so you don't read it straight through. Like a normal book, you always take a different route, as with web pages. That makes every read different, perfect for my island stay. For my luxury, I'd like to take a big Lego set, please. The more retro style, I think the current branding is classic. Then I can make anything out of it, rather than be limited to one specific theme. But, please, lots of different colours and shapes. Then, for spooky Halloween, I can use the browns and blacks. And for jollier days, some bright reds and blues. A walk on the wild and game side. Pies, pasties and sausages are on the menu at Yeovil-based Wild and Game as they promote the use of wild British game into our diets. Rachel Rowe reports. It's that season when thoughts turn to pheasant and venison dishes, but one local company is making British game a year-round food dish. Steve Frampton, the managing director of Yeovil-based Wild and Game, explained how it all began in 2017. We really wanted to sell more British game. Most of the game from British estates is sold to European markets. We want to change that and encourage more people to buy our own. Game is a great commodity in this country. People think that game meat is expensive meat. The Victorians started that by making it an exclusive food. But it's actually in abundance, especially venison and partridge. There's also a lot of people who don't know how to cook it or don't have a taste for it. All our meat is wild game. We source it from British game dealers and British estates, including those in Dorset and the West Country. Game dealers will buy from British shoots and estates and farms for meat like venison. The meat is processed quickly, so we have breast meat, whole birds and also pies and pâtés. What about the shooting season which will affect pheasant, for example? Our meat is processed very quickly and then frozen, so it's available throughout the year. It's not seasonal and there's no reason why British game can't be available all year round. We extend the season beyond the season. And wild game has a lower carbon footprint. It's also lower in cholesterol than other red meats. Some people are concerned about the carbon footprint with traditional farming right now and looking at vegetarian lifestyles. Game meat is a good halfway house as the meat is all wild. Tell us about the team. Well, we have three people at the distribution warehouse and three working on the business side. We also have an extended network of game dealers, obviously. The most popular products? Sausages all year round, especially the venison and pheasant sausage. We're also bringing back our grouse sausages, and we have a pheasant and caramelised onion variety too. Other meats like pigeon and rabbit are also popular. I just can't get enough rabbits to sell. Are you just mail order? We are, but we do supply a few shops too. Covid was the main reason for developing the mail order side, as the market virtually collapsed during the pandemic. But there's a massive demand for game meat. Everything's delivered frozen. People don't eat game every day, so they can put what they don't want to use immediately in the freezer. Once it's cooked, most can be refrozen. If you haven't visited the Wild and Game website, take a look, even if just for the recipes, though do look at the meat, of course. If you're in the I don't know what to do with it camp, there are many interesting and creative ideas on how to cook game with lots of inspiration for meals. So who's responsible for them? Jenny Price, our PR consultant, and Mark Robbins, our operations director, designed the recipes. We developed a range of them purely because some people are frightened of cooking game. When they look at our site, they can always find one that fits. We also do subscription boxes of game, and a recipe booklet is included, so it gets people thinking. People are always looking for more ideas and recipes. Your biggest challenge? Well, getting people to eat game. People have this idea that game is expensive and it needs to be hung for a long time, which results in that strong, gamey taste. That's not always a taste for modern people. Our animals are processed very quickly. 
so that strong game flavour isn't there. What are you most proud of? Really, simply to getting where we are today. We now have a customer base of 32,000, but it's been hard work. So what's next? We're focused on getting game into the British diet. We're about to launch a range of six ready meals. A lot of work has gone into the technical side and sampling. It's a long process. We also have a luxury pies range. We're always looking to try something interesting with game meat for the longer term prospects of the business. The review? Growing up, I used to eat a lot of pheasant as dad belonged to a local farming shoot. Like wild and game, we didn't hang game birds for a long time as we weren't keen on the stronger gamey taste. Having had to clean a few pheasants in my time, it was a pleasant change to receive a sample pack where all that processing had been done for me. Everything was well insulated so it could simply be popped in the freezer until ready to use and the delivery time from the courier was accurate. The recipe booklet really got me thinking about how to cook something different in ways I would never have thought about. For instance, Chinese style orange pheasant, anyone? The meat was very high quality and tasted delicious. I'm now a big fan of venison and pheasant sausages and I'm looking forward to creating a Moroccan style chilli with some venison mince. And have a look at Wild and Game's website, which is www.wildandgame.co.uk. And that's it for this episode of the BV Magazine podcast. Join us again next week for episode three. Until then, it's goodbye from me, Terry Bennett. And from me, Jenny Devitt.